will you be when the big earthquake hits? Hello, I'm Ted Wright, President of Earthquake Survival Services, who bring you this video. I sit before you as a survivor. My qualifications? I survived in a bomb shelter in my family's backyard for the first few months of World War II. This 6x8 structure, half buried in the ground, was always ready for our survival. We learned many things. Two of the most important, I believe. First, that early rescue and medical attention in the first few hours are vital for the continued survival of victims. Again, it is most important, and it was proved over and over again, that the quality of survival after a major catastrophe was dependent on the amount of preparation beforehand. I am aware that there are many people who say, but I'll deal with that situation when I come to it. I can't change that. But I am aware also of the vast majority of people who are concerned with the welfare and safety of themselves and their loved ones. A chance earthquake radio message in my automobile changed my whole life ten years ago. For it was then that I realized that I had a wealth of information that you did not have. I formed Earthquake Survival Services to bridge that gap, to produce products, services, tapes, books, cassettes, to share my knowledge with you. And now comes this video. My concept of the word survival and yours have an entirely different meaning, I realize. It can be said that unless you have experienced disaster, you have no conception of what it is like. TV pictures most certainly don't portray it. It's true to say that we Europeans are aware of what bombing is like. We are aware of people trapped in the rubble of buildings. We have seen, we conceive. My purpose in this video is to try to convey to you the drama, the reality of such situations, the positive things that we can do without bringing in the negative aspects that accompany major disaster. It would be true to say that for the first 48 hours we will be on our own. After 10 years in this business, I am beginning to become convinced. Nay, <laughs> I'm a believer. For the first 48 hours we will be on our own. But it doesn't have to be that way. Where 48 hours came from, I don't know. In my own opinion, the first 48 hours won't even see the dust settle. And most certainly, given the, the state of preparation as it exists today in our major towns and cities, a wholesale search, rescue, first aid operation at the citizen level is not possible today within the first 48 hours. Now, I realize that these remarks may be misconstrued. Lest that be so, let me give you a picture of what it was like for me as a young teenager in London at the beginning of World War II. When the sirens went off, we all went to our prepared shelter, which was equipped with food, with water, with all that we needed to survive for as long as we needed to be there. After the all clear sounded, I, as a civilian volunteer, put on my armband that said CD for civil defense. I took my helmet, 
my gas mask, and I went off as quickly as possible to report to my civil defense post, the one that I reported to. There, I was assigned a partner and a first aid bag, a portable stretcher, and we were assigned an area to go and carry out, as far as we could, search and rescue. Once in the area, we attempted as quickly as possible to find victims, to render first aid to them the best way we could. And then, we were not paramedics by any stretch of the imagination. But then, as quickly as possible, we climbed, we clawed, we made our way to our designated first aid station. Today, that would be called a triage station. Once there, we handed over our victim and left to report back to our station, pick up another stretcher, and to carry on with search and rescue for as long as it was needed. Now, I realize that today, under the conditions we have, the picture I have painted is not possible. There, will, there are no stretchers, there are no first aid stations, and when the major catastrophe occurs, the fate, the safety, injured people will be left to chance. Now for myself, I don't choose to leave my survival to chance. So for that purpose and to that end, I devised a simple, inexpensive, inexpensive system that allows you, the individual, to prepare for your own survival needs. Under our conditions today, it should never be that any one of us finds ourselves in a situation where our life is in jeopardy for want of knowledge of simple, basic first aid, the knowledge of pressure points to stop bleeding, the knowledge of handling of fractures. I may have to handle my own fracture to support it that I may be able to get out of my vehicle and evacuate a dangerous area. Simple knowledge of first aid is a primary concern. Now, it isn't just a matter of saying, let's prepare for survival. It isn't that simple. We know what it is we're preparing for, but we don't know when. We have no idea <clears throat> at whatever time of day it is going to face us. Now, I tackled the problem this way. Where will I be? What will I do? And what will I need? Now, these three concepts are the basis for the rest of this video. Where will I be? What will I do? And what will I need? First then, where will I be? I went round robin on this one, and you know I came to the conclusion that most of us lead fairly dull, humdrum lives. We get up in the morning, we go to work, we travel, we do everything just about at the same time each day. The other fact that emerged was there are only four basic places that I can be at any time of my day. I will be at home, I will be traveling, I will be at my place of work or school if I'm a teacher, or I can be the fourth place I term other places. Four places I am most likely to be and remember, we can only be in one place at a time. We all have one thing in common. We all get up in the morning and start our day. Now, I don't know what time you get up in the morning. You don't know what time I get up in the morning. But we all get up in the morning. So let's start there. Our home, traveling, our job, and the other places we go. We get up in the morning, we do whatever it is we have to do, 
and we leave at some time, get into our automobile, and we travel to our place of employment, our job, our business. We stay there for a given period of time, and then at the end of our work day, we get into our automobile, we either go home again, or we go to do those little errands that we have to do to the other places. We go to the beauty salon, we go to the gym, we go to the bank, we do the errands, we go to the store. Those then, we leave the other places, and we get into our automobile, and we go back home. This is our total day. Now our challenge is to prepare for any eventuality, any emergency that can happen over our given 24-hour day. We have agreed, where will I be? I can be in one of four places, and I can only be in one place at one time. Now another startling fact emerges. Of the four places I am most likely to be, only two of them are under my own control. My home, because that's where I live, and the automobile, because I own it. I am not in control at my place of business. I am not in control on the job. Very few businesses are prepared in any way for earthquake disaster. We talked about 48 hours. For the first 48 hours, you'll be on your own. I made the statement, I don't believe the dust will even settle in the first 48 hours. Could you survive in your workspace for 48 hours? How about for five or 10 days? Do you have any water? Do you have survival supplies? And as for the other places, which I believe personally are probably the greatest area of vulnerability that we can be in, I haven't seen a sign in any store, in any doctor's office, in any bank, saying in the event of an earthquake, do this. So we can say that the other places and the work situation are totally out of our control. We are dependent on somebody else. But we do have one thing going for us. We can control our environment in the home, and we can control the environment in our automobile. And that is where we're going to move. We are going to go into the nuts and bolts, nitty gritty, of preparing for survival in the home and survival in the automobile. Now before we do, there are many questions that come to mind. The whole area of the home and the automobile. What type of journey do you do? How long are you on the road? Where do you travel to? Do you go downtown? Or do you work in a hazardous place? Are you in the country? These kinds of questions. Now, because there are so many questions, and in this video, I'm not able to spend time answering them all, I did produce a, a video cassette tape, a cassette tape, audio cassette tape that answers all of these little questions about the automobile, traveling, and your journey. I also, for the home, produced an audio cassette tape that deals with the home and all its environs. This one is called At Home, Out and About, and it's primarily for shut-ins, for mothers with children, or for those people who may carry out their business from their home. And this one, the automobile, on the road and on the job, deals, as its title suggests, with traveling and the automobile. Where will I be? I will be in one of four places. What will I do? That's our next phase. Where will I be? What will I do? And what will I need? We are going to prepare, because it comes first, the automobile. There's an interesting little thing I would point out to you that of the four places we are most likely to be, we are most likely to be in our automobile. We leave home in the morning, we get into our automobile, we go to our place of work, we go to the store, 
We do all that kind of thing in the order. When we go home at night, we're back in the order. So if we talk about time on a 24-hour basis in taking away the time we're at home sleeping, the time we're at home for the weekend, the rest of the time, we most likely will be traveling. So preparing the automobile for survival is the next stage of this video. And we're going to go into exactly what to do and why to do it. Many people believe we Americans have a love affair with our automobile. This can be true. It is true that we do tend to spoil ourselves. We ride when we could walk. But, be that as it may, we have agreed there are only two areas under our own control at the time of earthquake. One is our home, one is our car. So it means that we should do the best job we possibly can to prepare our vehicle for survival. Now our family vehicle can come in many shapes and sizes. It can be a car like this one, it can be a van, a station wagon, or even a monster truck. Be it whatever it is, the purpose is the same. This vehicle is used to take me on my daily journey from point A to my destination. What is your daily journey like? Obviously where you will be is of primary importance both to your survival actions and your survival needs. Our type of journey, where we will be, the hazards we will encounter are important. We will talk later about hazard situations, high wires, difficulties. We're in downtown LA. High-rise buildings, lots of glass. If we imagine the earthquake happened right now, we would see that we have a very small roadway, very high buildings. The buildings that would collapse would fill this roadway. If we were to leave or attempt to leave, we would have a difficult journey. We can see that we would be clambering over obstacles, bricks, rubble. This is a type of journey that requires an idea of what my actions are. I have to be very definite and think about beforehand this is a situation I could be in at the time of the earthquake. I have to decide do I go or do I stay. Now you can see the importance of the survival materials that we put into our vehicle. Our go material must be handy and must be of such that we can put it on our back and still clamber to safety. Or is your journey like this one? A busy freeway, high speed traffic. We can imagine that if the earthquake happened, a long traffic jam, cars packed on top of each other, you could be into an accident situation. Most certainly it's a hazardous situation. But let us plan as we've asked you to do for just such a situation, one of many. Here we are on the freeway, all traffic has stopped. Now we make our decision, we are going to leave. What is our advantage over all of the other motorists on this freeway? Hopefully, many of them like us will be prepared. They do have gear that they can take with them. This freeway situation with traffic stopped will lead to only one obvious conclusion. We have to leave. This is one of many situations we could find ourselves in. We've talked about the hazards of our daily journey, the hazards on the busy freeways. This is still a freeway. This is a deserted, lonely part of our California freeway system. If this is where I were to land up when the earthquake happened, I would indeed be thankful for my earthquake survival supplies. This area is quiet and remote but just as hazardous as a busy freeway. For here I have to make my decision. Do I go or do I stay? It's too far for me to get anywhere. I have to stay. Thank goodness I have my survival supplies. Another hazard we'll face on our daily journeys are these lethal overhead wires. When the poles that support them topple, the wires will come crashing down. They could be on your vehicle. If they do, don't panic. You're safe while you're inside. 
but this is a hazard we must consider in our earthquake survival preparations. We have talked about the hazards of our daily journey. Now, standing underneath this overpass, we face another hazard. These structures string across our freeways as we travel each day. We know from San Francisco and San Fernando Valley that these structures are a hazard that we must encounter. Our hope is that we will not be resting underneath one when it comes down. In our daily planning for survival, I ask you to remember, when the traffic slows, do not come to a stop. Do not park underneath this most hazardous structure. It is a hazard we must face but we can take it into account in our planning for our own survival safety. We have talked about different types of vehicles, different types of journeys. Where will I be? Now we're going to talk about what will I do. The different types of vehicles and the different types of journeys all mean that at the time of the earthquake you could be in any one of the places we've already showed you. Underneath the overpass, with those wires coming down on the busy downtown section or even on a quiet piece of the highway. Wherever you are, you will make the same action that I will make at the time of the earthquake. We will bring our vehicle under control and to the best of our ability, we will stop in the safest manner possible. Now we have stopped. What do I do? Check for injuries, yes. The drama of our circumstance will determine mainly my immediate action, but after I've calmed down a little, my first instinct is to get out of the car. I have to remember there are certain precautions I must take before I do that. First, before I open the door, I must look to see there are no wires draped over the car. Remember those nasty wires overhead? Then when I open the door, I should check to see that there are no cracks in the roadway, that my vehicle hasn't stopped over a crack or that a crack came after I stopped. It would be foolish to step out and break my leg now. Now what do I do? I've checked and now I can get out of my automobile. Hooray, I'm safe. Breathe a sigh of relief. Where will I be? We covered that. What will I do? We covered that. Now what will I need? Our journey will determine our needs. Our decision, whether we will go or whether we will stay, also determines our needs. To cover every aspect of our survival needs, let's go now inside and do just that. Let's get ready for our needs. Where will I be? What will I do? What will I need? We've come now to the need portion, and we're talking about what we will need for the automobile. Now you remember when we were outside and we were talking about where will I be, I'll be in the automobile, what will I do, I'll bring it to a safer stop as possible. Then at that point I told you that this was decision making time. For the various factors that we outlined in that segment, we have to make a decision whether we're going to go or whether we're going to stay. So our automobile survival package must cover going and staying. Basically this is my go stuff, my backpack, my mummy sleeping bag or protection, my water canteens, my ever faithful never leave my side wrecking bar and this is my stay stuff. If I'm going to stay with the automobile I need to be able to sleep, so my sleeping bag. I need to be able to cook and have food for, uh, on a more regular basis. So this I call my luxury bag. We'll open that later. This is a food storage torpedo, food torpedo. We'll see them in the housing section when we get to house survival gear. And this is expressly designed for the automobile. Now, go, stay stuff and go stuff. Now, this is my go bag, and in this case, I prefer it. It's a backpack. I recommend backpacks, and I do recommend that the backpack, although it has handles, does have the advantage of the shoulder straps. 
You may be tempted to use a very convenient gym type bag that has simple handles. They're quite roomy and large. Don't use these for your survival pack for your automobile. The reason being that <clears throat> we need shoulder straps because after I've left the automobile, let's say I have to leave in a hurry, I take my go gear, I take and put my straps of water canteens, my mummy bag, and I run, if that's what's called for. But after I have cleared the way, I'm going to put on my backpack. I'm going to put on the shoulder straps, and you'll notice that my hands are free. This is very important if you're in a built-up area and you have to clamber over wreckage, over debris, over a house, over a pole. You need your hands free. I can tell you from experience that if you carry a bag which only has handheld handles, after a while of trying to climb and get away from things, you're going to dump it. And we don't want to dump because this is our gear. I'm going to um, open up everything and let us see exactly what's involved in survival gear for our automobile. Basically, it's quite simple. This, in actual fact, is what I have in the back of my vehicle, and it covers everything you need to either stay with the vehicle or leave. Everything I have here is pretty well around the house. Most of, a ha most of us have a sleeping bag somewhere. The food torpedo is plastic pipe which we buy at the, uh, at the plumber's store. These rubber caps are called J-caps. They're very inexpensive. They seal it up for us nicely. And everything in my pack you will see is inexpensive, not too difficult to obtain items. So remember, we are on what will I need. Now we're going to open everything up, and when we come back, we'll have it spread out. What will I need? Remember that. What will I need? And I know some of you are looking and saying, what a mess. You need all that. Um, I opened everything up to let you see exactly what we had. And you know, I'm rather pleased it's a mess. I'm rather pleased because as I pack everything away and we go back to where we were with everything packed up, you will see that although there seems to be an awful amount of stuff here, in actual fact, there's just the bare essentials. Now, to help me clear the table, remember I said I, as a person, I like to carry something warm that if I rest on my journey home or if I rest because I had to leave my vehicle for emergency reasons, I carry with me this old army mummy bag. Now, I don't know if any of you old soldiers out there remember these. I was not in the American forces. I bought this from um, an army surplus store for a few dollars, and they're worth their weight in gold. They're warm. You step into them. You can sleep in them sitting up. That's my mummy bag and my protection. I'm going to put that over there. Everything on this side of the table is my go stuff. Remember we talked about the stay stuff and the go stuff. And I like to keep on the outside of my bag all of my toiletries and personal items like that. And I like to keep inside the bag my clothes and things I'll need. Let me put that over there. Now, first of all, I carry because I'm rather hard on my feet, as many pairs of socks as I possibly can. I have three pairs here, one pair on my feet, so that if I left, I have pairs of socks. I carry uh, at least two or three t-shirts. I'll put those onto the bottom. Now, when you pack your bag, spread everything out as much as you can. I have a towel. And I have my face cloth wrapped in a Ziploc bag. I do this, obviously, to store as much moisture as I can. I do not expect that I'm going to use my precious water, my drinking water, for washing my teeth or anything like that. So if I do um, 
dampen my face cloth to freshen up. I want it to stay as damp as I can. That goes into the bag next. Spread everything out well and pack it down. I like to carry, uh, these are Huggies, they're baby wipes, they're damp, they're in a sealed container. This has been in my, my pack for months. Um, we talked about not wasting our precious water. I also um, carry some towelettes. And if ever I go to a restaurant and I have a meal and they give me towelettes and I don't use them, I save them for this purpose. Now, my next most important thing for you to have with you is a radio and fresh batteries. Now again, I've had this radio around for several months. I keep the radio in the box, keep it in the wrapping. And there's a very good reason for that. In my own experience, as soon as you open up a radio, somebody is going to use it. Ah, a radio, they use it. The batteries are flat. When you need it, it isn't live and it doesn't do you any good. So keep your radio in the carton and keep your fresh batteries also in the carton. You may say, well, how long do they stay there? I keep an eye on my survival gear. I know that I'm going to depend on it. I choose a radio that's fairly flat so that when I pack it, it goes down in there. I like to carry with me a roll of the pl plastic garbage bags. I'll keep those in a roll. Uh, garbage bags are wonderful. They serve a variety of purposes. I have in my pack a pair of scissors. And if it should rain, or I would need rain gear, or I would need to stay warm, other than my mummy bag, while I was walking along, I would cut the arms and the neck out, and I would make this into a poncho. Very, very handy. I can use them for uh, sanitation. Now, I have that one separate, but I normally keep them on a roll. So I use these for packing stuff. If it was summer and I were traveling through an orchard, well, I'd be fortunate enough to pick some fruit. Uh, I need them for sanitation. If I um, have to use my toilet paper en route, then I'm going to try and leave the countryside as sanitary as I possibly can. So it goes my toilet roll. Um, first aid. I carry with me my basic first aid and I believe that we can really get involved in a first aid kit if we're not careful. Um, you may spend a lot of money on first aid. I like to know what I have. I like it to be very practical. I don't carry a lot of band-aids. If I scratch and harm myself on the way, I do have some band-aids, but under the stress of the moment, I am not going to be too concerned about minor band-aid type cuts. What I am going to be concerned about is cleaning a wound. If I have a wound, I need to clean it with some mercurolite and some large compresses, and I carry with me ace bandages. I'm very concerned that we all understand that the types of injury that are going to debilitate us, debilitate us and are going to cause us trouble are going to be lacerations, uh, deep wounds where we need pressure points, pressure bandaging, even a fracture. I may unfortunately break my arm in my automobile and have a fracture. Now I know for my basic first aid that I could use, for example, my flashlight as a splint. Um, I could use my wrecking bar. I could improvise wood or a tree piece. But if I needed something to help me getting out of the automobile, I would use my flashlight, my ace bandage for a splint, and be able to support myself to get away from my vehicle. So I'm concerned with first aid that is essentially of a major nature. 
I want to be able to stop bleeding with compresses. I want to be able to apply compress bandages to anywhere I have to. So my first aid kit may not look as effective as a nice little uh, first aid kit that you would buy in the store, but it's certainly first aid for me. I carry first aid spray with me. I carry some eyedropper to clean out my eyes. Remember, in the first few hours that we are in a major earthquake, dust, flying bits and pieces are going to be very troublesome to us. We're going to get things in our eyes. We need to have stuff with us that we can clean our eyes out. I keep my first aid inside my pack. Now uh, I'm going to turn my pack round and I'm going to put away what few toilet items I carry with me. I have a razor, but I doubt very much if I'll use it because I can't spare the water. I have a portable toothbrush and I have toothpaste. I would probably use my mouthwash as my cleaning agent for my teeth. I am not going to use my valuable water for just cleaning my teeth, even though I like to have a clean mouth. So toothbrush, toothpaste, mouthwash to be used universally, a hairbrush, brush and comb, um, I don't know if I'm going to stop along the way and comb my hair, but in case I feel like it, then I'd like to have a comb with me. Um, I may meet some other companions along the way. I may meet a lady and she doesn't have a comb, and then I'd have one for her. I carry some deodorant with me. Again, um, if I'm on the road for several days, then I would like other people to come up and speak to me, so I do carry deodorant. I carry salt tabs. I carry salt tabs because under stress, and if I should be doing all this in the hot summer, 100 degrees or so, I'm going to need salt tablets. I keep them with me in with my toiletries. I have some hand lotion. You know, you can, you can buy packets of these little things in the major drug stores. You go down the counters and there are all sorts of little compartments with hand lotion and creams and shampoos and all that stuff. I just buy a few of them. They're very inexpensive. I have uh, drinking water tablets. I'm going to get to drinking water in a moment. I have my flashlight. Now, you may believe that this is rather heavy, large. Why don't I carry a smaller flashlight? I'm going to be on my own. If you're a lady driving by yourself, you're going to have the same gear. It's more comforting for me to have this type of flashlight which I can also use for a weapon, than it is to just use a little plastic jobby. Not only that, I may drop my plastic flashlight and break it. So I have a good, strong flashlight. I'm a great believer in good, strong stuff. I pack my flashlight away. Now it's long, so I use it as a brace. Put away my scissors. I put them in with my toiletry so I don't stab my hand if I'm reaching for something. I have... <coughs> And I carry with me in my go stuff high protein, high protein powder, high protein tablets, and there are a variety of fruit powders, orange powders, this kind of thing that you can use with your water, which I have. And of course, I remember that I'm going to need a drinking vessel. I'm going to need a spoon to stir. If I'm fortunate enough to get some fruit, I'll need a knife. So. I have my drinking vessel, my knife. I keep these powders inside my pack because this is my go stuff, remember. I pack this little bottle. It's a little squirter. You can use it to uh, fill some water in your squirt bottle. And if you fill your squirt bottle with water and carry it with you in your pocket, when you do need to clean out your mouth, you can do like these uh, famous players do in hockey and in basketball, they <laughs> and clean their mouth out without having to stop, take out the canteen and go through all that procedure. Now drinking water. I have 
two one-gallon containers of drinking water. And you can depend that I'm going to guard them very, very carefully. It is estimated that we each of us need one gallon of drinking water per day. Um, I'm an old army veteran and we learned to conserve our water. My canteen in the army was half this size and I maybe had to depend on it lasting me two or three days. So I am experienced at conserving my water. But even so, in the hope that I may find water, I have and carry with me drinking water tablets. Now these can be purchased at any uh, um, Boy Sc any, any store that sells Boy Scout stuff, fishing gear, sell these tablets. And according to the directions, you can see one or two tablets in your canteen of water will give you fairly safe drinking water if you were not able to uh, have a source of fresh drinking water from a, a large container or a truck. Now this is um, a very useful item and it's called a drinking straw. It's very simple obviously. You put some water in here, you put it in and you drink through it. This straw, innocent as it seems, will actually filter and purify 35 gallons of water. Now, I don't know if the manufacturer actually measured 35 gallons. It probably would do 36 gallons. I don't know. But it does filter over 30 gallons of water. Now, if we talked about one gallon of water today, uh, a day, then obviously this little drinking straw, this little beauty, will filter for us 30 days' supply of water at least. And you know, I don't know about you, but I hope I've arrived to wherever I'm going in 30 days. This drinking straw, incidentally, has a, a filtration process built into it that filters out bacteria, filters out um, microorganisms, all sorts of things. This really does a great job on water. It, you know, when I first started ten years ago, we didn't have these type of drinking straws. We were concerned with the purity of water. We were concerned and we were talking about using bleach and this kind of thing. You know, it's so great today. We've arrived at the point where companies like mine have searched out and produced, in some cases, products and services that can be used for survival. And here's this little drinking straw you could take it with you camping or wherever. 30 days supply of water in that little straw. It's wonderful. So I keep that in a very safe place in my pack. And uh, uh, that's, here we are, ready to zip up. Now that, you remember, was my go gear. That's what I take with me. This is pretty well where we started. My go gear, my canteens of water, and of course, my ever trusty wrecking bar. Now this is my stay gear. You remember I talked about my luxury bag? It doesn't look very luxurious. But inside I have <coughs> a simple blow-up air mattress. Now this is my stay gear. So if I have to stay with the automobile, then I'm going to be as comfortable as I can. So this simple air mattress I blow up, and when I'm tired of sleeping in the car, you ever slept in your car? After a while you get so stiff. So to avoid that, I get around the problem by having a bag, a, a mattress that I can blow up and keep me from the ground. I have, this we said was our food torpedo. Now, in the go gear we had high proteins, we had high energy foods. Proteins, I would have raisins in there and things like that. In our stay gear we have grains, cereals, rice, lentils, things that with this little camp set that I have, I'm able to cook my rice and cereals. I carry with me some of these soup items. 
that just need water. I have tea, hopefully I'll make some tea. I carry a couple of breakfast cereals. I have nuts. And according to your own ideas, you could see that this is a wide open field of having many, many things that you can use as camp out stay gear. This is my stay gear. I have a bag and you can see it's full of um, cocoa, chewing gum, tea bags, all sorts of things. The list is endless. You can have soup powders, you can have all sorts of things. My go gear and my stay gear. This is, in a nutshell, what will I need for my automobile. Now I'm going to pack this up and we're going to go and get the old automobile ready for survival. What will I need? Here's the gear we packed inside, remember? I've divided it into my go gear and my stay gear. I'm going to put my stay gear in the trunk. This was, you remember, our luxury bag. It contained our cooking gear, that nice little blow up mattress that I had. Here's our food. Remember our food torpedo? A word about the torpedo in the hot trunk. You'll find it a good idea in the middle of the summer. I use my sleeping bag, which is part of my stay gear, and I open it and use it for an insulator to keep my food from spoiling in the food torpedo. My, my go gear, first of all, remember I talked about the uh, trusty breaker bar that never leads my side? If I am in the automobile in time of collision and I have to break out, I'm going to need this wrecking bar to break the windshield or the side window that I can get out. I myself keep mine in the front seat, underneath the seat. This blanket acts as a protector, so in the event of a collision, this bar will not injure me. So that goes under my front seat. Now we're left with our canteens of water and our backpack. I may be in a situation, and you may be too, where your go gear, your backpack and your water you may need to take them into the workplace with you. If your automobile is parked in a dangerous area in one of those high-rise parking lots and your gear's inside it and you come out and find the parking lots flat with your car inside it, you probably would wish you'd taken the gear inside. So I'm going to put my gear in the rear seat of the automobile where it's handy for me to get to. The other advantage of keeping the backpack in the back seat with you and your water canteens is if you happen to be in one of those situations we already showed you, that downtown LA scene by the way, you may wish to grab your gear as quickly as you can and leave. So go gear goes in the vehicle with me or in the trunk, it's your discretion. The stay gear most certainly goes in the trunk. So I'm all packed up there, put this little string away, close my trunk. I have remembered my blanket and my wrecking bar inside the car. And I could say my vehicle is now prepared for anything that could happen to me whilst I'm on my journey, either going to or from my workplace. I am earthquake prepared. In this video so far, we have talked about the four places we are likely to be and the only two places we can control. We've taken care of the one place, our automobile. Now, let's take care of the other place our house. In California we live in a variety of homes. We live in townhomes, condominiums, apartments, mobile homes. We live in large mansions. We live in housing tracks. 
We live in a great variety of places. We live up on the mountain, down by the beach, we live in the valleys, we live in the deserts, we live in the seas. No matter the type of home, home is the most important place to us. It's where we live, and nobody likes to think that at the first tremor, the whole thing is going to come down around his head. But we are dealing and preparing for a major earthquake, they say 8.3. The magnitude is beyond the imagination. Not in living memory have we experienced an 8.3 earthquake. Now, I'm not going to discuss or debate the merits of the different types of homes, this home over that home, where it is, etc. But I am going to say, from the point of view of the intensity that we are preparing for, for my purpose and for the purpose of this video, we are going to start with the worst possible scenario. We are going to start with the home completely disintegrates. The home cannot be lived in. Now, in this video, I am not going to spend time talking about the safety of the home, going from room to room, fixing things, you know, in the telephone directory, in the little booklets given out by cities and municipalities, this area has been covered extensively. There are some points, however, about the home and home safety we must discuss. The first one I would bring to your attention is we must consider communication. We have just finished in this video talking about traveling, talking about the automobile, and our two decisions, whether we go or whether we stay. We have to consider, and we have to know, the members of the family must be aware, are we going to be home after the earthquake? I'm reminded of a little girl at one of my seminars, and I asked her, are you prepared to stay at school? And she said, of course. And I said, oh, I was a little taken aback. And she said, I will probably stay at school for up to five days. And I said, why is that? How can you be so sure? And she said, both of my parents travel. Neither of them can get back from where they are. So I know my safest place is at school. Wasn't that impressive? That little child was not only prepared, she was prepared emotionally for the situation that was going to be hers. Her parents could not return. In your family, have you discussed, have you talked about, can you get home? Are your children to stay at school? If you cannot get home, have you arranged for somebody to pick them up? Communication between the family members is essential. That's number one. Number two, we must discuss, and it's very important for you to consider, if we say it's likely that your home is not going to be habitable, then that means when the first tremors start, as soon as you're able to safely leave that home, you're going to do so. Now, it could be the middle of the night. Have you discussed how you will evacuate your home, how your family members will leave, and where you're going to meet? Here's a for instance. A fellow wakes up, like me, I'm a very heavy sleeper. I wake up, trembler, ooh, 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 it stops. I leave, I go to the backyard. As soon as I get there and my head clears, I think, I wonder if Jimmy made it. I'm not sure. I don't see him. I go back in the house. The aftershock comes. I'm trapped. I am a victim. Little did I know, Jimmy was out front. I went out back. This could have been avoided by communication. We must communicate our evacuation plans. We must know where we are going to meet so that when we hit there, maybe all sleepy-eyed in the middle of the night, we'll all arrive at the same place and we will know that everybody is out safely. There's only one other point on houses I'm going to talk about. And that is, by my bed, I have a stout pair of slip-on shoes. They're almost like slippers. And because I have a bronchial condition, and because I know that when the house, if the ceiling comes, 
the first thing after a major trembler, dust, debris, and I'll not be able to breathe. I keep by my bed this little face mask. The first thing I do is slip my hard-soled shoes on, put on my face mask so that I'm not caught coughing and choking and cutting my feet on the way out of the house. Now, there are many, many other aspects of home survival that you should be aware of. And as we had tapes for the automobile, I have this manual that's prepared, and it deals with your home, with room-by-room -room evaluation, what type of lot, which direction your lo on your lot your house sits, all of the conditions that you need to know. It talks about finding out where your utilities come in how to turn them off, this kind of thing. This is a companion piece to the video. We cannot go room by room. We cannot dis discuss the house in great detail. What we must move on to now is preparing our home for survival. I said, and it's true, in all of my approach to earthquake survival planning, I take the worst scenario possible. I take it that I am not going to be able to stay in my home. Now, let's consider the home. Even if it survives, it will not have any services. There will not be any water, any gas, any electric. The phone won't work. You can't use the toilet. You can't cook your food. Further, and I'd ask you to remember this, Mexico City, in the first 48 hours after the earthquake, and it was not an eight-pointer by any means. In the first 48 hours, there were 46 aftershocks, many of them six-point and greater. So we know that after a major trembler, you are not going to want to go back into your house, which means if your house is a shell, you can't eat in it, you can't cook in it, you can't sleep in it, you're going to go where I'm hoping you go, into your backyard. And this is what we're going to talk about now. We're talking about surviving in our backyard. In order that we may <coughs> sort some confusion, some sense out of the confusion of planning, after all, if I'm going to live in my backyard, I'm going to need, hmm, I'm going to need, I better think of. In order to give you a formulated plan, something that's very simple, I ask you to consider five points, five categories, that's what we're going to deal with, that you need to think about for your backyard survival. Number one is your personal needs. Number two, tools and utensils. Number three, food and water. Number four, first aid. And number five, personal welfare and morale. Now those are the categories I'm going to deal with. We're going to go over them point by point, and we're going to start with our personal needs. We're going to spend a lot of time together around this table, and I'm going to deal with all of the five categories, one at a time, item by item. I'm going to generalize a little bit. Our first category, personal needs. Now, if we're going to be into backyard survival and we're going to be out in our backyard, we're going to need somewhere to put each of our departments, each of our items. I'm starting here with, uh, this is a footlocker I picked up at a second-hand store. There are various types of footlockers, steamer trunks, um, suitcases, things that people don't seem to have a need for anymore. They're excellent for survival. They're strong, they're waterproof, they take a lot of beating. And as you can see, this one, incidentally, I brought this in for my own backyard. This one looks um, part of the family, huh? Personal needs, we're in our backyard. We've come out of our house. We may have come out at any time of the day. We may be sitting around watching TV. We may be in bed and asleep. However we hit the backyard, we are going to need to start from there. So I need, first of all, 
a change of clothes, or I need some clothes to start with. I may be in my night clothes. So, first of all, my personal needs are my clothes. Now, before we really get into personal needs, I am preparing this for me. This looks male, because I'm packing it for me, and I'm a male. There are pants here, there are t-shirts. It's a great idea, and to involve the rest of the members of the family, if you have each of them prepare their own survival personal needs. Teenagers like to have their own sloppy jeans or their own things that they like to have on. Remember, we are moving now into a time of stress. We're going to be in our backyard. We're going to be different. It's fun to be able to say, hey, let's go camp out in the backyard, but all of the services are off, the telephone is off, maybe some of the family members didn't return yet. It's a time of stress. So we need to be aware that this is a very serious undertaking and we're going to prepare to stay in our backyard for as long as it takes. I've said all the way through my personal opinion at least 10 days. So I need pants, obviously t-shirts, I need lots of socks. I'm going to be digging around. We're very fortunate in California. If it's summertime, the weather is kind to us. We maybe can exist in pants, in shorts. We don't need a lot of heavy tops. But if it's winter, don't forget, we will need the winter type of gear. We will need our heavy coats for the cold winter nights. I am not big, and you won't see a lot of toiletries, towels, and things like this. We may be fortunate and be able to secure water very early on after the earthquake. We may not. Most likely not. Water is going to be a precious commodity. We need to conserve water. We need to change our habits for a little bit. We cannot go out and take a shower. We cannot use precious fresh water to clean up our face and our bodies. We're just going to have to tough it out. But we can with mouthwash. We talked about this in our automobile, remember? We can use our mouthwash for our cleaning our teeth and so on. We need the basic clothes that we will need for 10 days. There's no laundry. After you've finished, and I always advocate rolls and rolls of plastic bags. They have so many uses. Our laundry will be stored for after the earthquake. We may exhaust our clothes, but carry as many clothes as you can in your footlocker. Clothes, pants, socks, a towel. Now I have, this is my personal needs. I have my blow-up mattress that I got back from my vehicle, a sleeping bag. You may have a tent. I have my toiletries my own supply of toilet paper. Each member of the family should keep their own supply. And as this is my personal needs, any special medications that you may need. I uh, have a bronchial condition. My doctor has me take a medication. I don't take it only when I require it, but I need it to be there. So my special medication goes in my own personal corner of my footlocker. If you're a vitamin or a health food, make sure you have your vitamins with you. Um, I am. I'm a health food person, so I have my vitamins with me. This is not part of the food and water we're going to talk about later. These are my personal needs, my personal vitamins, my personal medications. From uh, uh, the female side of the family, you would need your own feminine needs, this kind of thing. So this first segment, personal needs, clothes, toiletries, and any special medica medications or dietaries. Personal needs. Tools and utensils. I have four sons, and when they were younger, I used to take them camping. And it would take me most of the day to pack the family station wagon to go on a weekend camp out. When I got home, I found that the majority of stuff I'd packed, I didn't use. 
So when I started earthquake survival study and preparation, those experiences stood me in good stead because you will see that my tools and utensils are stripped to the minimum. I don't have an extensive toolbox. I have only what I am going to use in that backyard under survival conditions. I keep my tools and utensils, both metal objects, together because I use for my supplies this gym type bag which everything can rattle around in and not hurt itself and it's very handy when I need it. Let's start with tools, basic tools, and I'm going to pull up this one first. This is a water shutoff tool. May not be familiar to all of you, but out in the front of your house, in the ground with a concrete cover, is your water main supply, your shutoff. You need to go to it and turn off that water when you need to, and down there are a variety of different types of shutoff valve. These tools come in different shapes and sizes. They all do the same thing. They enable you with this long length to turn off the water easily. A water shutoff tool. I said we're not going to go room by room on this video and all of the things that are necessary for your house, but turning off the services is essential. The water, the gas, the electricity. This 10-inch crescent wrench hanged by my own gas meter. I brought it in for this show. It's a heavy crescent wrench and you will find that your gas shutoff is very stiff. You need something big and heavy. That's a shutoff tool used for shutting off your gas. I try to have my tools as universal as possible, doing more than one job. We can't do it all of the time. Saws, for example. This is a wood saw. I can only use it for wood because I'm not a carpenter, I'm kind of clumsy. I use a stiff, short saw with very strong, coarse teeth. It really cuts through wood. But for metal, I need a hacksaw. These can be purchased at any hardware store and you need them to cut metal. In our survival in the backyard, we probably will be cutting metal pipes or pieces of metal to make things with. A universal tool, this is, uh, uh, I use it for an axe and for a hammer. It's actually a roofer's tool. It's universal for me. It has a little cleft in it which I use to tighten wire and that kind of thing. A hammer and an axe in, in together. The other universal tool, I just love this. I used one when I was in the service. I bought this one in a military supply store, a few dollars. It's, as you can see, it can be used for a chopping uh, axe. It's a spade. It's a pickaxe. And when I straighten it out and lock it, it's an ordinary shovel that has many, many uses around in our backyard survival. I have a pair of channel locks. These are universal type tool. They can be used for tightening things, undoing things. I use them for grasping. If I have a rough wire or I want to pull something from the wreckage of the house and save my hands, I use channel locks. They're very universal. I advocated when we were talking about the automobile plastic bags. And when we did our personal supplies, plastic bags. Now for this part of our survival, plastic sheeting. Plastic sheeting is universal, has a dozen uses. You can use it to make a little pup tent, a shelter, a windbreak, all sorts of things. It is, however, very difficult to attach to a surface. If you put nails in, it rips and tears. But the answer, another very, very handy tool, is the staple gun and, of course, lots of staples. With the plastic sheeting, we can use the staples and make just about any shape we need. I learned that the pioneers used, this is baling wire. Comes in different sizes. It's very universal. You can use it to tie things, attach things, repair things, hold things. It's very, very strong. But in order to use it, you need to cut off pieces 
and rather than just have cutters, I have a pair of pliers with a cutting edge that allow me to cut and twist my wire. Another little pair of little tools, a smaller a crescent wrench, adjustable, because this one, remember, is going to be back with my gas. This one, we're not going to do a lot of heavy work, so a small, handy tool. And to cut my sheeting, I have, and I have many of these little uh, knives, safe knives that we can put away and use for cutting. I insist, I insist that you put into your gear a good pair of gloves. Safety in our survival in the backyard is of primary importance. Please, don't tear your hands up doing all these little chores. Have some gloves with you. Tools, very, very simple, very, very basic. I have duct tape, I have some electrician's tape, some string. I'm sure I've shown you enough to stimulate you into the great variety that you can build on from this simple start. Keep it very basic. Keep it simple. A few simple tools. Utensils. I said when I started putting earthquake gear together, um, honey, I need some utensils. We need double up on this and double up on that. And uh, it was not very popular around the kitchen. There wasn't enough stuff to it. So I went out around the second-hand stores. In fact, it became quite a hobby of mine whenever I'm out. I look for buys on silverware, um, the Salvation Army, the Goodwill. You see bins and bins and bins of knives, forks and spoons for a few cents each. According to the size of your family, build yourself a secondary set of cutlery, utensils. Also don't forget, you do need cooking utensils. We're going to be out there in the backyard. We're going to be frying, we're going to be making basic things as we see when we get to food. And we need elementary tools, basic tools that we use in cooking. Mixing bowls. Um, I have a couple of saucepans, a frying pan, a tea kettle. Again, you can pick these up. When you're shopping, become survival conscious. If you see a deal on mixing bowls and it's, it's not too expensive and they're all packed nicely together, different sizes, they're ideal to buy them and put them away in your survival supplies. These saucepans, you can tell um, they're not good looking, they don't look like they just came from the store, they're well used. A couple of the items I have come out of that original camping I did with my sons many years ago. You'll see I have plastic ware plastic plates, bowls, plastic drinking vessels, drinking mugs. I use plastic because there's no dishwasher. We cannot spare our precious water to wash our dishes. Now when I was a Boy Scout, we washed our dishes in the mountain stream, rubbing sand and that kind of thing. My backyard doesn't have a mountain stream. It doesn't have sand. So I use plastic. Plastic dishes and plastic containers and plastic bowls and basins come in such a variety of sizes and shapes. I am sure that it would be interesting for you to pick out different types of plastic ware for your family. Remember we had a lot of garbage black plastic bags? This is what they're used for. Keep your backyard tidy. Plastic dishes, use them, throw them away. Tools and utensils, a start, bare basics, keep it simple. Food and water. From the point of view of backyard survival, food and water both pose the same problem. Our problem is the shelf life of our food and the shelf life of our water. Now, we are encouraged one gallon of water per member of the family per day. For a family of four, four gallons a day, 28 gallons a week. We are also encouraged to use storage for our water, 
keeping it cheap, keeping it inexpensive. Most of us are encouraged to use the plastic one gallon containers. They, are, they have milk, they have fruit juices, a variety of containers, mostly milk. Also, uh, this came from my yard prior to the shoot, and it's a 20 gallon styrofoam water container. When you buy it, you buy it with a spigot that enables you to get the water out. It's good 20 gallon storage. It contains well, it's well made, it's thick. But water has a short life. The enemies of water are light and heat. When we go into the backyard, I will show you the method that I developed to bury these in the ground, to keep them at a cool temperature, to keep the light away from them, and to increase the shelf life. Cleaning out the, the uh, containers before you put the water in is most essential. There is uh, a separate video on water purification and food, arranging food, drying, all aspects of food. We're not going to spend a lot of time in this segment, but there is a separate video. Basically, you should remember, after you have used whatever was in your one gallon container, it needs not only to be washed out thoroughly to take away the residue, especially milk, the cap also needs to be cleaned very thoroughly. Then I recommend that you take, this is ordinary chlorine bleach, Clorox type bleach, take at least two teaspoonfuls to each container, put in a few ounces of water, put on the cap and totally cover the whole inside of the container with that chlorine mixture. These styrofoam containers do absorb whatever bacteria is in the water. They do absorb odors. So clearing them with chlorine bleach starts off as clean and as sterile a container as you can have. Pour away that container, that uh, chlorine mixture, fill up the vessel, put on the cap, and put it into storage. On these large containers, I use the same technique about one gallon of water, at least four ounces of Clorox, seal the container and roll it and shake it around. Now in the first aid section, where we'll be talking about bacteria and infections, intestinal infections, the things that we fear when we're surviving in our backyard or when we're camping, we will be talking about filtration and I'll show you some different types of filters. Water and food. Now, food, we said, has the same problem. We're dealing with shelf life. I'm opposed, personally, to canned goods and can-type storage for your survival supplies. <coughs> One, they have a short shelf life. And two, they're very bulky and heavy to carry. When I first started to do research into backyard survival, apart from my own instincts, which I talked about in the beginning of this video, I was faced with the problems of food, shelf life, and also another enemy we don't talk about very much, but we have to consider in our survival preparations and that is sudden evacuation. In the automobile, we talked about our decision to go or to stay. At home, we're going to stay. That's what we're preparing for, backyard survival. But there is the situation where we may be required to evacuate or we may ourselves decide to evacuate because of various reasons which endanger us. Fire is one of them. If fire is sweeping down your housing tract or where you live, you are going to have to leave. If you leave, you're going to take whatever you can with you. 
That's why water-wise, I always keep my automobile water intact in the automobile. Not that I'm going to run and drive away, but I do have those canteens you saw that I can take with me. So, how can we, how can we find food which has a long shelf life, which is easily transportable, which fulfills our needs, and yet still is palatable and nourishing for us to survive on? To answer that, I suddenly realized that the early pioneers crossed this country without refrigeration, without any ice, without any storage, just with what they had. And their method was to use grains and cereals. And so I recommend, have written, and lectured extensively on the use of grains and dried fruits, foods, dried nuts, cereals, grains, dried meats, fish, thoroughly dried, which have a long shelf life. Also, the pioneers had their favorite little thing, and they called it the sourdough pot. And I make sure in my survival kit, I have the ingredients, yeast and flour, for a sourdough pot. My company researched, developed this, uh, we talked about it in our automobile, the food torpedo. The food torpedo is nothing more than a piece of plastic pipe. It's available at the hardware and the plumber's stores. This one is four foot long. It has two rubber caps called J caps. And this is the cutaway display that I carry around with me. And it shows inside the partitions with food packets in between. One of these torpedoes, properly packed, will support a family of four for five days. It's packed with grains, with cereals, with all those kinds of things. Each day is separated so that when we open the food torpedo, day one is in its packet at the front. I have various types and sizes of food torpedo. I realize that I'm not the only smart one around, and you would quickly, I am sure, come to realize that a small torpedo like this could take breakfast cereals, another one like this, not quite so large, could take dried fruits, raisins, nuts, and ones like this would probably have the day's supply separated as I have them. You will see on this little one, it's quite interesting, it says, and it has the instructions for making pancakes. All of the mixture is, here, is in here, and it tells you, add so much water, make the mixture, and you make pancakes. In here also is a sourdough starter. Now, I have as a display, more for stimulation than anything, some packets of sampled foods that are available for us. With all of the rice and the beans, the different types of beans, different types of rice, different types of noodles, um, different types of raw nuts come in these bags. There is no end to the variety of foods that can be packed away, taking the bulk poundage packets, putting them into smaller packets so that they are available for use as they are. Remember, in the backyard, if you have a 10-pound bag, for example, of pinto beans, once you open it, you're only going to take what you need for that day. You don't have a refrigerator put, to put leftovers in, so you're going to take what you need for that day. There's the open bag. We're in the backyard. It, the territory of <laughs> those who came before, the ants and the so on and so on, the little creepy crawlies. So by preparing ahead of time, by having the size packets that your family needs, if you're a family of two or four or six, these little packets put into the water and cooked are sufficient for you for that meal. In my companion book that we showed you earlier, Survive, I Dare You, The Earthquake Awaits, there are whole sections and chapters on food, 
menus and how to put this kind of food together and make it very palatable and very nourishing. There are no end to the variety of little packets that are already available for us. Whenever I go in the grocery store or a wholesale grocery store or a restaurant supply store, you will find all of the little packets of jams, of honeys, of cocoa, of sugar, of tea, of coffee, all sorts of things. Now, I said I was opposed to canned goods, but there are available these little small portion. I think they were designed for senior citizens and singles, and these, although they don't have a tremendous shelf life, do have a fairly long shelf life. They're light, and as long as there aren't too many of them, they do give you a variety in your diet, and they're very easy to use, easy to store. They go into the food torpedo easily. Also remember, uh, I have many of these little salt and pepper shakers. You buy them wholesale. They're covered, they're sealed. You put them in the containers. We are going to need seasonings. Those of us with families are going to have to provide for our family what for them is a very dull, a cereal, grainy type diet. Very nutritious. They don't realize it, but it isn't the pulp and sugar that they're used to. I've scratched the surface of food. I've told you about the food torpedo. When we go outside, I'll show you how we bury these food torpedoes in the ground. We bury them for two reasons. One, the ground has a constant temperature. It keeps them at a constant even temperature, around 62 degrees. And more importantly, when I bury this food torpedo, only I know where it is. If I have to leave, I can, as you can see, quite easily take several of these food torpedoes under my arm and evacuate. I can give one to each member of the family. Come on, grab a torpedo. We have to leave. And our food is with us. The advantage of having the torpedo packed so that all of the days are there and your day's food is in one place, breakfast, lunch, supper, is that if you have to evacuate with a food torpedo and you can only carry so many, you don't end up with a torpedo that's full only of dried fruits, for example. So have your torpedoes, use your own ingenuity. There's a variety of things to do with them. And uh, later on in the video, we'll talk about uh, the literature we have available to show you how to make your own food torpedo and the different kinds of treatments that you can use. I've scratched the surface on food. I've given you an elementary introduction. An introduction for what, for many, is their standard diet. Vegetarians live on this kind of food, grains, cereals, nuts. The rest of us, we're experimenting. But this is a brief introduction. There's a lot of literature available. Uh, you don't have to go to health food stores only to find this kind of food. It's in your grocery store. And for myself, each time I go to the store, I buy a five pound bag of beans or rice of something. That becomes my storage. This kind of food carried the pioneers across our country. And this kind of food approach will enable us to live in our backyard successfully for a long period of time. For the other members of our family, our silent loved ones, please remember to provide for your pets. They also need survival preparations. They also need to survive. This fourth section deals with first aid, water purification, First aid, also from a backyard survival point of view, must include health. I realize that when the earthquake occurs, we probably will have to run out of our house and hopefully not encounter serious injury on the way. Now we're in the backyard. Now this is where we're going to live for the next several days, maybe the next several weeks. When we talked about first aid and the automobile, you remember that my first aid kit was very elementary, was simple, a few 
ace bandages. That was about it. Now we're going to stay. We're going to stay in our backyard for several days, several weeks. So we must be prepared for our first aid requirements and our health for the next few weeks. And we must be prepared from a first aid point of view to take care of ourselves no matter what. We cannot call the paramedics. We cannot call the ambulance. We are on our own. This first aid kit I have for backyard survival is larger and more comprehensive than I had before. And it will cover a greater variety of minor injuries. You will see uh, I have a supply of gauze bandages, compresses, gauze compresses, adhesive compresses, triangular bandage, large gauge sections. Um, I have eye cleaning capability, metholite, knee bands, knuckle bands, adhesive tapes of various kinds, a good supply of ACE bandages, more ACE, the big large ACE bandage, and in the bottom here I have a lot of cleaning supplies solutions, eye cleaning, eye droppers. I'm, I'm conscious and I want to point out to you that all of the injuries we receive in our backyard, the minor injuries we receive, are going to be complicated by dirt, by soil. So most injuries, even little scrapes in the backyard, we require a thorough cleaning with a cleaning solution. Normally, we would run in the house, run it under the faucet, clean it good, dry it and put on a Band-Aid. We cannot do that in the backyard. It's a different approach. So keeping a good supply of cleaning solutions, um, rubbing alcohol, this type of thing, keeping those things around to be used for cleaning wounds will be a, a lifesaver and save our precious water. First aid in the backyard, as a general subject, must include general health. And you know, when we think about our backyard and living in our backyard, we must be concerned with infection. And infections will come from two sources. Because of the lack of running water, our water contamination must be considered. And because of the lack of good sewerage, we must be very careful with sewage and our toilet arrangements and preparations. We are not able to wash our hands each time we go to the toilet. We must be sure that our water is not contaminated before we use it. Now, in most of the presentations that I've given over the years, water has played a major role, how to store water, the ingenious little arrangements, saving the milk bottles, we demonstrated it here on this video so far. But we must always consider that water has the enemies of light and heat. Our water treatments in the past always relied on chlorine, using bleach, a few drops, you know, you read the telephone book, there's an excellent little diagram in there that tells you how many drops for how much water you should use in order to put away water that will be fairly clean. But after water has stood around for a, very, a good period of time, there's a great danger that bacterial activity may have started. Now, <clears throat> living in the modern age that we do, comes the age of the bacteriostatic filter. And these filters I have are very simple uh, gravity-fed filters, and there are many different types on the market. We already showed you our little straw, our drinking straw. This is a bacteriostatic filter. And bacteriostatic filters are high carbon compact granules which are heavily packed with silver. And the silver 
breaks down and destroys bacteria not only in the water that you're treating but in the filter itself and filters that do not have this quality are not safe in as far as the very action of filtering out bacteria from the water charges the cartridge with bacteria which is put back into further water that's treated. With this type of filter we are able to heavily chlorinate our water supplies before we put them away. Now obviously the more chlorine we can use the longer the life of the water. But <clears throat> the great problem in the past was if we over chlorinated our water we had to boil it or we had to further treat it before we could drink it. Now with these modern filters we're able to heavily chlorinate our water, heavily clean the inside of our containers, especially plastic, with a good chlorine solution. And then when we come to use our water, putting it through the filter, we have bottle pure water available for us. So we've dealt with first aid, and we've dealt with water, and to a certain extent, we've talked a little about some of the things we're going to talk about when we go into the backyard, sanitation and our toilet arrangements. First aid, water, first aid, water treatment lead to safety and good health in the backyard survival. Well-being and morale. Unusual topics for an earthquake survival video perhaps. Remember, we are moving into a time of great stress, of great tension, an unknown that we all are going to face. We have talked in this video of survival in the automobile, the decision-making process to go or to stay. We are talking now backyard survival, there are some I've heard who say make, it, make backyard survival fun like camping, like camping out. We've gone through the procedures, you've seen us, one, two, three, four, five. But sometime in there, we must have time for us. I must have time for me as an individual. I'm worried, I'm under stress. I'm not quite sure what happened or what is going to happen. I don't know if the earthquake's going to happen again. I don't know when the next aftershock is. I have to have an anchor to hold on to. I have to have something for my personal self. It is day. We go through our day. And remember, we're going to be like the pioneers. We will start when the sun comes up and we will sleep when the sun goes down. We may not sleep but we'll prepare for sleep. It is said, and I believe it, I'm convinced, the number one requirement is going to be water. But for my own personal assessment, I believe the number two priority is going to be light. Light for our environment and light for our protection. So number one on my list for my survival and morale is my lantern. My Coleman Lantern. Lanterns come in many shapes and sizes. There are excellent battery lanterns, not too practical for obvious reasons, but with my Coleman Lantern, with some extra filters, and with a good supply of fuel, I know that I have light each evening. A flashlight. Now, different to the flashlight I had in the automobile, this is the one that goes onto the belt it leaves my hands free. It enables me to make a late night cup of coffee and have light to do it. This type of flashlight is not the only one of its kind, but it's the type of flashlight I recommend, the hands-off flashlight. The radio, the batteries, we talked about them in our automobile. Leave it in the packet. Keep it safe and secure. The batteries stay fresher this way. I need my radio to keep abreast of what's going on. Maybe I will be able to pick up something from out of state that has music. I'm going to be listening to reports of earthquake, tragedy, etc. 
I put into my morale and, and well-being my address book with all of the addresses of my family. I'll tell you an interesting story about addresses and family and telephones. We have, I'm sure you do too, one of those push-button phones and it has a memory in it. And it just has names. Aunt Clara, Uncle Fred, Brother Bill and so on. But it doesn't have any telephone numbers. I don't know half of the telephone numbers on my telephone wall. And one time when the power was out and we lost it all, I came up with my address book and I realized it's just as important now as it used to be in the old days. My address book. If I have to leave and I can get to a telephone, if I have to evacuate, my address book with me. I keep a diary. I don't know if you do. But I have a diary with me and I am going to say... Out of this diary, perhaps, there'll be the great American novel. Who knows? A camera, some film, fresh film, to record the scene, some fun times, something fun that happened during the day. My daily reflections and meditation, whatever your persuasion, something that's meditative, books, magazines, and this funny little tube, something like the food torpedo. This is documents. Funny thing happened. San Francisco. Apartment complex. 49 apartments and one resident manager. When the Department of Emergency Services was set up and people were going along to receive financial aid and grants, that one address, 50 apartments, had over 150 people claimed to live there. When this fact became noticeable to the Department of Emergency Services, they requested proof of residence. Hmm, proof of residence. If you were out now and suddenly stopped, could you prove that you lived in that house? If you don't get home for a few days, and when you do, someone else is in your home, are you going to be able to prove it's you or them that actually lived there? Proof of residence. Very simple. A telephone bill, a utility bill, something that proves that you live where you live. Put it into this document torpedo, we call it, bury it in the ground. Also, at the time of the great earthquake, Afterwards, when we start, even afterwards, when things are beginning to get a little bit back to normal, plastic, our credit cards are not going to be any good. By the time they get the computers set up again, this kind of thing, San Francisco had that problem, cash. We need cash. I need cash to buy gas, etc. Cash. What will I do with my cash? What about my valuable jewelry? The heirlooms. Aunt Sadie's brooch, something that's kept in the house. It isn't used very much, but it's very valuable. It's sentimental. I'll tell you an interesting little story. In London after the war, long after the war, there were these huge streets of rubble. And eventually, the bulldoz bulldozers came along and started to clear all the rubble. And all that was left was flat land. And in many instances, from out of nowhere came people digging on the flat land. They were digging for their valuables that they buried. When their house came down, they couldn't get to the ground. Once the ground was cleared, they went in and found their valuables. Out of that uh, came the idea of the document, valuables, or money torpedo, for want of a better word. It's a smaller piece of pipe, has the same J caps, very inexpensive, can be buried in the ground and only you know where it is. My morale and my well-being. I am going to survive because I am a survivor. I'm going to have to occupy my time. You know, we cook our meals, we do our thing. There isn't very much to do. Life is going to become very simple. Time is going to hang on our hands. And I'm going to reach for that book, I never had the time to read. This one's been on my shelf for many, many years. 
seven pillars of wisdom. Perhaps from the earthquake I'll come out with some more wisdom. And finally, for my own sense of well-being and morale, I take with me my teddy bear. We survived in our automobile, now let's survive in the backyard. During the planning for this video, we considered many kinds of backyards, but our conclusion was if we could take a normal backyard with no particular features about it, and if we could make that survival proof, then we would surely be doing something that you would like to see. So we chose this backyard, we're going to go around it, and the first consideration I had when my producer challenged me, let me see you survive in this backyard, my first thought was, wouldn't it be nice to have a cup of coffee? So the first thing I tackled was the fire pit. I'm going to show you two different kinds of fire pit. This one is a very simple structure. It's built kind of high so that you can have a, a heavy big fire for boiling your big pots. It's made as you can see, there are many configurations. These are simple stones, edging stones they're called. Then I took two construction bricks with two oven racks, a simple trough, some kindling, and you're ready to go. This demonstrates that the plastic bags I stress so heavily, put on two sticks, make excellent windbreaks. So here we have a little area, we would call this the kitchen area. We have our fire pits, our movable windbreak, and we're ready to start preparing the family food and getting us settled down for survival in our backyard, probably about two hours after we hit the yard. Having taken care of our cooking and made our little kitchen, our next need, it would seem, would be for food and water. So here we are in our nature's pantry. Here is our food torpedo. Remember we talked about burying them in the ground. This is a shallow trench. Less, uh, it's not as deep as I would have made it normally, but for the purpose of the video, it's a shallow trench, but you can see there it is. Buried in the ground, it will stay at constant temperature, and only you know where it is. Now let's move on to water. You see this little cap here? This is a one gallon jug buried in the ground properly as it should be with the soil nicely packed around it. This other one I half buried. See there it is. It's a nice little trench, exactly the width of a trenching tool. I have room for three one gallon containers here. You may wish to use a larger tr a trench or keep them in small sections and put them all over the place. Food and water. Wasn't that simple? It is not difficult. Backyard survival is you figuring out how to take care of your needs. The bathroom. For some, the most important room in the house. For others, a sanctuary. In backyard survival, the bathroom becomes public. We are taking this most cherished private activity with our families normally in the privacy of a closed room and bringing it out into the open. We have talked in this video about the importance of communication between the family members. This is one area we should have fully discussed before we arrive at this point. We are going to make a bathroom which is safe and sanitary out here in the open where we all are going to survive and all of the family members are going to use this, the bathroom. I made my structure. It's very simple. It can be constructed of simple materials. I used four blocks. They have to be very firm. I sunk them in the ground first. Then, with my auger-type post hole digger, I dug out a center hole probably four and a half, five feet deep. Now, the procedure is very simple. 
and I'm sure as you look at this, you yourself can think of improvements immediately. A structure around with supports, probably an old toilet seat to make it kind of homely and familiar, especially for children. But basically, a hole in the ground, the old-fashioned outdoor potty place. When we use the bathroom, after using, instead of flushing, one scoop of lime, one scoop of soil, down the center hole, and you've finished. Now, your aftercare of yourself for your sanitary needs, remember you cannot have water. We're not going to use our precious water for washing. So we need to have an alternative. I talked earlier about using uh, rubbing alcohol. We could use up the old aftershave that we don't have any use for now. Anything that sterilizes our hands and keeps us clean. Remember, we are fighting for sanitary conditions in our backyard survival. Now in this particular bathroom, we show it to you with just the four walls, for two walls for demonstration. We normally would have four, probably with a slight opening and a privacy screen for going in and out. You may decide you wish to make two, maybe a, a one-off in an isolated area of the garden for the children and somewhere else in a different location for the adults. Whatever the choice, whatever you decide to do, we have to face the problem of backyard survival and having a bathroom. Simple, construct it, have it ready, or at least have the materials ready so when you do hit the backyard, you are ready for survival, just as we did with the kitchen. The bathroom can be there, ready for you quite quickly. In our backyard survival so far, we have tried to take you through the normal activities of a normal family during the day. We needed somewhere to cook. We had our fireplaces and our kitchen. We needed food and water. We had our food torpedoes. We had our water of various kinds sunken in the ground. We may have had the large 20-gallon barrels buried and hidden around the garden. We had our bathroom, simple as it was. So we have taken care of family activities in our backyard survival. Now for our resting place, we needed to have a shelter. Which direction the shelter went is entirely up to your garden, your backyard, where the sun and the wind are. This is the most simple structure we can devise. It's a pole. This could be a piece of wood taken from your wrecked house if your house were wrecked. Or it could be the edging of the lawn or the edging of a flower bed. We pull it up, we stretch it out, we staple onto it either a tarp if we have one. We could use our plastic sheeting, but we make ourselves a shelter. And underneath I put the sleeping bag just to indicate, what would we say, this is the bedroom. So now we actually have a three function, three facility backyard. The kitchen, the food storage, the bathroom and the bedroom. Backyard survival, that's about it. It's very simple, isn't it? Now, there isn't anything that we've used out here that you don't already have around you. We didn't go out and spend a lot of money. We didn't go out and arrange all sorts of expensive things, although we could have done. Let me just spend a few words before we close on some aspects of survival in the backyard. You could have, for example, a nice gas barbecue. That would be wonderful. You could have a tent. You could have one of those sheds in the backyard, the tin ones or the wooden ones. If you did, you could clear it out and use it for a sleeping place. There are all sorts of things you can do in your backyard to make survival successful. Remember, your challenge is you have to function in the backyard under all conditions, in the summer, in the winter, in the cold, whatever it is. If it's windy, find a shelter. Make a shelter where there's a lee. If it's raining, make yourself a shelter that you can shelter from the rain. Remember we had the five areas that we covered. We had our foot locker, our tools, our first aid box. We haven't gone into the intimate detail of where everything is. But I think we've shown you enough that you can figure it out. 
Backyard survival is possible. Backyard survival is a matter of you taking up the challenge to survive. I dare you, the earthquake does await. Now for me, it's been a long day. I'm tired. I'm going to take my teddy and I'm going to take a rest. Since 1981, I have been involved in just the kinds of things I've been involved in during this video. Bringing the message to the people, simple methods of survival, using inexpensive and sometimes winging it to develop a survival plan with those items that we are going to need for our survival after the big one. We have said, and I have used the phrase many times, for the first 48 hours we are going to be on our own. I want to avoid the time frame of 48 hours. Rather, I would concentrate on we are going to be on our own. I am convinced that reasonable people would be more aware of their survival needs and do something about it if there was a simple plan that could be put into effect. During this video, we have tried to present just such a simple plan. Using the techniques that we have outlined, all that is required from you is your time. It's very inexpensive. Most of the items we used were already in your own home, weren't they? As a survivalist, it has always been my hope that more people would become aware of the great danger that lurks beneath our feet. There are many who say, I'll deal with that when it comes. I cannot do anything about that. But I am aware of the great majority who are concerned and that I can do something and that I have tried to do something about in this video. Survive, I dare you. The earthquake does await. And I'd like to leave you with this thought. Which makes the most sense to you? A great amount of preparation and no earthquake? Or a great earthquake and no preparation? The choice really is yours. Thank you very much. Be safe and good luck.